welcome to our series of programs titled 15 Parables Unveiled and Understood. Today we are on the 15th of the parables that has to do with the parable of the talent. So let me review what each of these parables was about because it paints a beautiful, wonderful picture of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Of course, Yeshua gave parables to people because he wanted some to stay in blindness temporarily and he wanted others to have their eyes open. So he has given to the church, those who have the Spirit of God in them, the understanding of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, through these parables. But people who do not have the Holy Spirit, for them he has concealed the meaning and this is only temporary. It may be temporary in the sense that a person lives their entire life, never understands it, they die. But God says that people will be resurrected, people like that who never had their first chance at salvation, their only chance at salvation because their eyes have been blinded. He says that after the thousand year millennial reign of Jesus the Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, here on earth, there will be a second resurrection. It talks about Revelation chapter 20, the rest of the dead will be resurrected after the 1,000 year reign of Jesus the Christ right here on earth as the King of Kings. And so that's why I say it's temporary because these people will have their chance. If they die, it's not permanent. They're not condemned to death eternally. They're not thrown into the lake of fire. They just have not been judged yet. Okay, so... Please understand that, that God is so merciful, so loving, that he wants for everybody to be saved. And if his plan of salvation ended when Jesus Christ returns to this earth, we would have to say that God's plan has been very, very unsuccessful because most people who have ever lived have never accepted Jesus the Christ as their Lord and Savior. But thank God that's not the end of his plan when Jesus returns is just the start of another phase, and not only the start of another phase, but the start of the greatest phase. During the 1,000-year reign of Jesus the Christ here on earth, that will be the beginning of a major, major push for salvation, where everybody will have their opportunity for salvation. And during the millennium, it's going to be all of the people who cross over from this present evil world that's controlled by Satan the devil, crossing over to the world that's controlled by the Son of God, Jesus the Christ. So that would be all the people who survive the Great Tribulation, the Battle of Armageddon, and the Day of the Lord. All of those physical people who survive that, they will be the ones taught by Jesus the Christ and by us, the resurrected saints, who work with Jesus as kings and priests. And you can see that in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10 and also Revelation chapter 20 and also in Zechariah chapter 14 verses 1 through 5. It talks about us as the resurrected saints helping Yeshua to rule over all of the world. So most people don't know those beautiful truths but that's a wonderful marvelous truth that that will be really a new stage, which is a powerful stage, where the Holy Spirit will be poured out on all humanity for everybody to truly have their chance at salvation. Then after the 1,000 year reign of the Messiah, you can also see this in Revelation chapter 20, it talks about there being an eighth day, this great white throne period of time, and it's called the last great day because this is the greatest number of people who will have their opportunity for salvation. This is all the people who have ever lived, perhaps 50 billion people who have ever lived all the way up to the time of Christ's return, who have died. They will be resurrected and given their first opportunity and their only opportunity for salvation. So this would include, for instance, all people who never heard the gospel preached, all people who mentally are challenged so they could not process the understanding of the words that they heard. All people who died, for instance, early, before they could be 
mature enough to make a decision. And yes, even people who are hearing my voice today, who are blinded, they are deceived, they're not being judged, they're going to hear what's being taught, and it's going to go in one ear and go out the other, because God has not intended for everybody right now to have the chance at salvation. What God is doing right now is allowing the world to suffer from making choices contrary to Him, so that eventually we'll be humble enough to say, I'm throwing in the towel. That's it. My ways have ended up in futility. I have been deceived. I've become depressed. I've become diseased. <coughs> Excuse me. I've become disabled. And of course, I've received death. And that's all because of Satan the devil and his demons. Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. He also is called the god of this world. And he has deceived the whole world. So when people are awakened and they say, no, 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 no. I don't want to repeat that way of life. I see that there is a new way of life under a new god of this world, the son of God, Jesus the Christ. And this is after the 1,000 year millennial reign. You're going to have a lot of people testifying to the goodness of the Lord. Then people will say, yes, I accept Yeshua as my Savior and my Lord. And we're talking about billions and billions and billions of people being saved at that time. That's why it's called the last great day or the eighth day, a period of time also called the great white throne period of judgment when people will be resurrected to physical life and given their first and only opportunity for salvation. So that is a wonderful plan that God has for all of mankind. In future programs, I'm going to be talking specifically about the seven annual appointments with God because these seven annual appointments picture God's seven-step plan of salvation for all of mankind. And hopefully you'll be able to tune into that. I also covered some of these principles in a series of programs titled Seven Eye-Opening Examples. You can go to YouTube and check those out because I went into that a little bit talking about God's plan of salvation for all of the world. So here though, we have an example, parables, that teach some people about the kingdom of God, the mysteries behind the kingdom of God, and by understanding the truths, by having these parables unveil and understanding them, you understand the mysteries of the kingdom of God. It's no longer a mystery to us who understand. For the rest of the people who don't have the Spirit of God, for them the true meaning of these parables is still locked. So let's go over, let's rehearse what all of these uh, parables were about, and then we'll get to uh, the 15th one, the talents. The parable of the sower of the seeds and the wheat and tares, both of these parables, which are parables number one and two, they illustrate the different responses to the gospel and the different fates of the responders. Some, it fell on stony ground, and then the birds came and ate them up. Some fell on another type of ground, the sun came up, scorched them. Some fell on thorns and thistles, and it choked out the word, and some fell on good soil, and these people went on to produce fruit. So please uh, go back and listen to those programs. But the parables of the sower of the seeds and the wheat and the tares illustrate the different responses to the gospel and the different fates of the responders. Then the parable of the mustard seed, which is our third one, the parable of the mustard seed, showed us the growth of the kingdom of God from being the only kingdom that is not visible to being the only kingdom that is visible. The kingdom of God is on the earth right now, but it's only in true believers of the Messiah. All right? To the rest of the world, it's invisible. That's what I'm saying. The parable of the mustard seed showed us the growth of the kingdom of God from being the only kingdom that is not visible. This is the only kingdom on the face of the earth, the kingdom of God, that resides in true Christians. This is the only kingdom that's not visible to people in the world. It's invisible because it's spiritual. The other kingdoms of this world, they are visible because they're run by human beings. Now in 
the future, it's the only kingdom that will be visible because when Yeshua returns as the king of kings, he's going to throw down all other kingdoms so that there will be only one kingdom. There will be many nations still, but all nations will have one king, and that is Yeshua the Messiah. He is the king of kings. And then when we go to the leaven that's hidden and the hidden treasure, so that's number four, number five, the leaven that's hidden and the hidden treasure, this shows us that the hidden person, the hidden person behind the successful growth of the kingdom of God is Yeshua. All right, so it's leaven that's hidden and it's hidden treasure. It points to Yeshua being the one who's hidden. He's the hidden person that's behind the successful growth of the kingdom of God. Right now, Jesus the Christ is seated next to the Father in heaven, and he is in the process of building his kingdom. As the word is preached, as the gospel is preached throughout the world, God chooses some to come under the leadership of Jesus the Christ as their king. So he is the person who's behind the successful growth of the kingdom of God. And these two parables, the leaven hidden and the hidden treasure, they emphasize us seeking Yeshua. We have to be seeking him. And the Father says, if we ask, if we seek, if we knock, we shall find. But that is only possible because God initiates that process. Many are called, but few are chosen. Because nobody can come to Jesus the Christ unless the Father draws them. So God has to initiate that. And when he pricks our hearts, then we start searching for the truth. He leads us to this hidden treasure, which is Yeshua, and he becomes our king. And then we go down to the parables of the precious pearl and the lost sheep. The parables of the precious pearl and the lost sheep, that's six and seven. And they emphasize Yeshua seeking us, Yeshua seeking us. We are the pearl of great price that we have to be sought after. It says that a merchant sought after a pearl of great price. The Father is searching for people who can be a part of his family, who can be a part of his kingdom, who can be a part of his church. And he, you remember the merchant goes and sells everything to purchase that pearl of great price. Well, Yeshua's blood is what the Father used to redeem us, to purchase us, so that we've been redeemed from death, and now we can have life. That happens through the Father using Jesus as the currency to purchase us, to redeem us from death. And of course, with the lost sheep, he goes after us. We are very, very valuable. Now we know that Yeshua is seeking those whom he can save, and the Father is, of course, directing Yeshua to do this. And we know that it happens in stages. First, the gospel went to the Israelites, and of course, the original church, everybody was an Israelite, including Jesus, who was an Israelite from the tribe of Judah. Even Paul, who eventually went to the Gentiles, he was of the tribe of Benjamin. So they're all Israelites, they're all Jewish people. So the gospel went first to Jewish people, but of course most Jews rejected Jesus, and that's because that was God's divine design. He planned for that to happen. He knew it was gonna happen. He planned for it to happen. He's okay that it happened. He's going to make it right. Those people are not condemned to eternal death. They were not judged according to what they were doing because they were in blindness. And it talks about blindness has happened in part to Israel until the time of the Gentiles. So that's the second part. After the Jews rejected Jesus and Paul was sent to who? To the Gentiles. So when we talk about the Father seeking us as lost sheep, he's talking first about the lost sheep of the house of Israel, not necessarily talking about the lost 10 tribes, just meaning that people are lost in the sense that they can't find their way. They couldn't find their way to Jesus. So he went first to Israel, who was 
like sheep without a shepherd. That's why it's the lost sheep. And then he went to Gentiles, who obviously had no shepherd until Jesus came on the scene. And then you go to the parable of the unforgiving servant, the vineyard workers, and the two sons. So 8, 9, and 10. All three of these parables dealt with attitudes that will prevent people from getting into the kingdom of heaven. Parables 8 through 10, the unforgiving servant, the vineyard workers, the two sons, they all dealt with attitudes that will prevent people from getting into the kingdom of heaven. As an example, the parable of the unforgiving servant talks about a lack of forgiveness. If we don't forgive others the way that we've been forgiven, God is not going to have that kind of person in his kingdom, in his family. Then also lack of faith that had to do with the vineyard workers. You remember that the vineyard workers, the ones who came early in the morning, the first ones, and keep in mind, the first ones, they negotiated a contract to say, pay me a certain amount, as though their work warranted them demanding from this rich landowner that they pay him according to their works. Now, our works can't get us salvation. Our works can't get us eternal life. We can't work to earn eternal life. Our work results in death. The wages of sin is death. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, so none of us can earn salvation. That's why it has to be a gift. So you notice that the other workers in the vineyard that came later, they didn't do a contract. They simply said, we trust you. We have faith that whatever you want to pay us, it's going to be more than enough. That's us saying we have faith that the blood of Jesus can wipe away our sins, and we can't pay for that. That's priceless. That the life of Jesus, because he never sinned, so he's the only person who is righteous by keeping the law, that his righteousness can be imputed to us, and he's the first one and the only one thus far who has died, and been resurrected to eternal life. He's the first and only one to whom that has happened. And then he's the, called the first of the first fruits. So of course, at the first resurrection, and it's called the first resurrection for a reason, when Christ returns, there will be a first resurrection. That's the resurrection of all of the other first fruits. Jesus is the first of the first fruits. Everyone else who's resurrected at Christ's return are also first fruits. So these have to deal with the lack of faith, the vineyard workers, and then with the two sons, that one has to deal with a lack of repentance. You remember one son said, no, I'm not going into the field, and then he went. The other son said, yes, I'll go into a field, but then it didn't go. And that was representative of, again, the Jewish nation who said, yes, we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, we have Moses, we have the law, we have Yahweh Elohim with us, we have the temple, he dwells in the temple, we are the nation, we are under the covenant, and yet when Yeshua came, they rejected him, and Yeshua is the vineyard, he is the vine. So it's like, they were the first ones to receive this message, and they said, yes, we are servants of yours, and yet when Yeshua came, they did not obey him. They did not recognize him as Lord. So that's the lack of repentance where the um, sinners, the tax collectors, those were the first people, not the religious leaders, not the Pharisees, not the Sadducees, not the chief priests. They were not the first ones to accept Yeshua either. So we have two cases. We have the physical Israelites, and then specifically we have the Israelite leaders. They thought that they were following God, but when the Messiah came on, they rejected it. They didn't go into the vineyard. So then what you have is Gentiles. First you have Jews, then you have Gentiles. They are the ones who are like the tax collectors, the sinners, the other son that at first said no, but then repented and went into the vineyard. Gentiles, that's why it's called the time of Gentiles in Jesus' day. In the earliest days of the church, it was the tax collectors and the sinners who were looked down upon. They were last in people's minds, the lowest. The Gentiles were last in people's minds, the lowest in terms of the uh, Jewish leaders and the Israelites. 
they did accept Yeshua as their Lord. So that's why it says, many who are first shall be last. The first ones to receive the gospel, the physical Israelites, and the scribes, the Pharisees, the Torah scholars, the Sadducees, the chief priests, the religious leaders, they all thought they had it, but then they rejected Yeshua. So they thought they were first, but they were put last because they had this wrong idea that our works, we're going into the vineyard, we're making this contract that our works could give us salvation. So it's works of the law, righteousness, and of course no one can have righteousness by the law, therefore no one can have life by the law. But other people who live in a repentant state, they say we understand that all of our works is going to end up in death. We have to accept by faith God's uh, gifts, so we do repent. That would be like the Gentiles. Again, that's why this is the time of the Gentiles. And that's also like the tax collectors and the sinners who are the ones who repented. So those who are looked at as last or the last ones to be offered salvation, they become first because they're the first ones to accept it. So we are the first fruit. We're like that son who at first was not repentant, didn't want to go into the vineyard, but then later did go. Okay, then we get to number 12, which is the wedding guest. The wedding guest, and, uh, well, actually, no, I'm sorry, we skipped cruel vine dressers, so that's number 11 and number 12. So both the cruel vine dressers, number 11, and the wedding guest, number 12, these parables dealt with prophecies of what would happen to the physical nation of Israel for rejecting the Messiah. All right, so again, the first shall be last, but what is the consequence of being that? Again, parables 11 through 12, the cruel vine dressers, which are like the Israelites who killed all the prophets, who even killed the chief prophet, Jesus the Christ, who is also the Son of God. And then the wedding guests, the many people who were invited to the wedding, but they declined to come. They went off to do their own thing, and they even killed some of the servants that came to them, which again are the prophets coming to them. They even killed some of them, said, get out of my face, so then God said, Okay, well, just invite a whole bunch of people in. What happens to the physical nation of Israel for rejecting the Messiah? And they should have been prepared, prepared for his first coming due to the signs of the times, but they weren't prepared, so they were looking for a military Messiah to come and give them freedom, so they missed the fact that there was a Messiah who is the Savior of the world. He came first as a lamb, He's coming as a lion. They expected him to come as a lion in the first place, and that's why they missed him. So the consequence was that in 70 AD, the Roman Empire came and destroyed the sanctuary, the temple, destroyed the city, and destroyed millions of Jewish people. And then by around 133 AD, that was called the Diaspora because the Jews were removed off of the land. So that was the punishment uh, for rejecting the Messiah. And the thing about this truth is history repeats itself. The gospel is going out to people today, and many people still reject the Messiah, Yeshua, to be their Savior, to be their Lord. He is not the Lord, He is not the Savior of most people in this world. So again, there's going to be terrible destruction that comes on this world for not accepting the Messiah Yeshua. But we're not talking about the eternal fate of people. We're just talking about people experiencing a lot of suffering and then experiencing the first death. But we're not talking about the second death because that's eternal death. So we're not saying that the Jews that rejected Jesus, that they have been condemned to eternal death. Again, they were blinded, so therefore they're not judged according to uh, eternal life or eternal death, they will be resurrected after the millennium, during the great white throne period of time. That's who the rest of the dead are. The rest of the dead are those who were not resurrected during the first resurrection. So the rest of the dead have to be all of those who lived and died, having not had a chance to know Jesus as their Savior, as their Lord. So they'll be resurrected and given an 
opportunity for salvation at that time when their eyes are open. So then we get to parables 13 and 14. Now this is more ominous, parables 13 and 14, because this is dealing with people who have accepted Yeshua as their Savior and Lord, and then they turn away and reject Him. That is much more ominous. So parables 13 and 14, the fig tree and the ten virgins, are prophecies of what will happen to the spiritual nation of Israel, not the physical nation of Israel, but the spiritual nation of Israel for rejecting the Messiah. And we should be prepared for his second coming due to signs of the times. The physical Israelites should have been prepared for Yeshua's first coming due to the signs of the times. But they missed the signs, and so they missed the exit, and they drove into a lake, and their car just went to the bottom of the lake, and they died, so to speak. Well, we should, as true Christians, the spiritual nation of Israel, and I say spiritual nation of Israel rather than physical nation of Israel, because whether you're a physical Israelite or a spiritual Israelite, I mean a physical Israelite or a physical Gentile, everybody has to become a spiritual Israelite, and that only happens when we have the Spirit of God in us. That's what makes us a true Israelite, one that prevails with Yahweh Elohim. That is what a true Israelite is. Israel, the name Israel, when Jacob's name was changed from Jacob to Israel, the name Israel means ones who prevail with God, ones who prevail with El, Israel, ones who prevail with El, El means God in English. So we are true Israelites because we have the spirit of El in us, and that gives us this power to prevail with El, because the Holy Spirit is the power of El, the power of God. And that is what allows us to be transformed into El's, or God's, image and likeness. If we receive Yeshua and then reject Him and we've committed the unpardonable sin, that is going to lead us to the second death. Because God won't pardon us for our sins because we won't repent. And that's the sad story when people ultimately won't repent even after their eyes have been opened, then there's only one thing that our Father can do, and that is to put people into the lake of fire. That's the second death. That's eternal death. Nobody will be resurrected from that. They will be as though they never were. All right, and then the final parable, which is the talents that we're going to cover today, the final parable teaches us what we need to do to be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven in the fullness of its glory. What do we, as true Christians, the first fruit, what do we need to do to be welcomed into the kingdom of God in its full glory? I've been saying that one of the mysteries of the kingdom of God is that it's here now and it's coming in the future. It's here now in people who have accepted Jesus the Christ as their Savior and their Lord, but it's invisible to the world because of something spiritual. In the future, the kingdom of God will come to this earth in its full glory, meaning that everybody will see the kingdom of God because everybody will be able to see Yeshua, the Messiah, because he will be on this earth as the king of kings and as the Lord of lords, as the priest of priests. And on top of that, he is going to bring us with him and we will be administrators in his government, those of us who are a part of the first fruits. He will turn us into a kingdom of priests, like we are now in the kingdom of God in this hidden, invisible way. But again, in our fullness of glory, we will be a kingdom of priests. We will be kings and priests, ruling with Yeshua the Messiah as the king of kings, as the priest of priests. We will be helping to teach God's way of life, His laws, to all of the world till it comes to the point where the knowledge of Yahweh covers the earth as the waters cover the seas, the oceans, the lakes, etc. So what do we need to do right now in order to guarantee, so to speak, that we will be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven 
in the fullness of its glory. Again, we cannot work for salvation. That's not what we're talking about. We can't work for salvation. But there are works that we can do to guarantee that there's going to be a grand celebration when we come into the kingdom of God. It's like, man, the stuff that I gave you, you multiplied that so much, you were faithful and little, I'm going to give you much. You really did a lot with what I gave you. You didn't waste any of the talents that I gave you. So come into my kingdom and you will have rulership over many cities. That's what it's talking about. So it's not talking about earning salvation. It is talking about because we're faithful in little, God will make us faithful in a lot. So let's study this parable now, the parable of the talents. This is the 15th parable. And this is in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 14. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 14. The kingdom of heaven is like a man going into another country who called his own servants and entrusted his goods to them. The kingdom of heaven, it's in mystery, but we're about to understand more about the kingdom of God. All these parables teach us different aspects about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is like, is like what? A man going into another country. So who's the man going into another country? The man, of course, is Jesus, Yeshua, who goes into another country. Where's the country? He ascended to heaven. That's the country he went to. He's not here on earth in his physical presence in his full glory like he will be when he returns to this earth. And when I say in his physical presence, meaning that he can manifest himself with flesh so that people can see him. That's what I mean. So he's not here on this earth in that way. He's going to another country, which is heaven. And he called his own servants and entrusted his goods to them. He called his servants. Who are the servants? In this case, it's you and I. Those of us who are alive today and all people who have ever been servants of the living God, who have the Spirit of God, from Abel on, all of us, he entrusts goods to us. And those goods are really the Holy Spirit that gives us gifts of the Spirit, different administrations, different talents, so to speak. And then in Matthew chapter 25, verse 15, now we're going to see in detail that he gave talents to different people. Matthew chapter 25, and verse 15. This is Matthew chapter 25, and verse 15. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his or her own ability, then he went on his journey. Now, people may think that this is unfair. When you gave five talents to one person, you gave two to another, and you gave one to another. That seems to be unfair. Why don't you give five talents to everybody? Well, let's look what the scripture says. It says, he gave to each one according to his or her own ability. What that is saying is maybe due to someone's background, their upbringing, they might not be able to read too well, as an example. They may be illiterate. Do you think that a literate person is going to write a lot of books about the Bible, a lot of history to support what's said in the Bible? Do you think somebody who may be literate and educated but never went on to learn about science or astronomy, do you think that person is going to be used in a mighty way to teach people about science and how science, true science, and the scriptures are all together? No, of course you don't expect that. Now somebody who's highly educated in multiple fields, they've studied astronomy, they've studied archaeology, they've studied mathematics, they've studied horticulture, they've studied history. These people may be used in a lot greater way to do a lot more things. You think about the Apostle Paul. Why did the Apostle Paul write 14 books of the Bible, if indeed he also wrote the book of Hebrews? Why did God use him? Well, because he was trained 
at the feet of Gamaliel, and he became a Pharisee of the Pharisee. Not only that, he spoke Greek. He was a Roman citizen. He spoke Hebrew. So he was used in a powerful way to not only teach Israelites, because he was an Israelite, taught at the feet of Gamaliel, which was one of the highest intellectual Jewish people in history. He was taught by Gamaliel, so he knew Judaism. He was steeped in it, and yet he was a Roman citizen, knew how to speak Greek, highly educated, so God used him to go to the Gentiles. He lived in both worlds, so he could deal with both worlds, okay? That's an example of someone who might have five tongues, where another person who's not well educated, they may only have one talent in that sense of the word. You think about somebody who's a very timid person. Maybe they've been abused as a child and they're socially inadequate. They really don't like crowds. Would you expect God, even after that person is converted, even after they receive the Holy Spirit, Scripture says God is called the weak of the world. Now he expects us to get stronger. He expects us to grow in his grace and knowledge. But do you truly expect that person to be one who goes out and becomes a Billy Graham type person speaking to thousands of people? Well, most likely that's not going to happen. All right, so that person might have only one talent. Now, having said this, please do not misunderstand me. I don't want anybody to be offended. There are some people who, for whatever reason, maybe their parents were slaves, or their grandparents or their great-grandparents were slaves, and they did not learn. So it's not to say that they didn't learn because they were stupid. It's just maybe they didn't have an opportunity for learning because you had some racist people who prevented them from learning. That's a possibility. Nevertheless, maybe those people went on to learn on their own Maybe studying at night under a candle, and maybe after the abolition of slavery, they did go on to go to school, and they became fantastic educators. So I'm not saying just because someone starts out in one spot, they can't progress to another spot. Okay? God, through the power of His Holy Spirit, does transform us, and some of us can become very powerful so that we're no longer the weak of the world, and some people just grow at a faster pace than others, some people do use what God has given them a lot more than other people. So that's all I'm saying. I'm not trying to judge anybody that starts out one place because they could surpass somebody who was highly educated, who had a PhD, but just sat on their butts not doing anything because it's like, well, I have salvation. That's all I'm concerned about. That person could be surpassed in the sense of someone who didn't have that education, but did a lot to grow in God's grace and knowledge, did a lot to serve people. Again, uh, serving people, whether you have education or not. Feeding the homeless, visiting people who are, are sick, starting a school yourself, even if you're not highly educated, but knowing that you should hire people who are highly educated, and you could do more with what God has given you than somebody who has a PhD who just says, well, I've got mine, and that's all I'm concerned about, and doesn't truly reach out to people. They're not moved with compassion. They don't have a lot of love. They have the Spirit of God, but it's hard for them to be transformed. So, again, I'm not trying to judge anybody. I'm just giving examples of possibilities of what God is saying when he says, to each according to his or her own ability. Our Father and our Lord and Savior, they know us, better than we know ourselves. Often like parents know their children better than the children know themselves because they've been around. They've seen things. Well, the father and the son have been around and seen plenty of things, so they know us better than we know ourselves. They look out, they evaluate, and they say, to each according to his or her own ability, I'm giving these talents. Now, I'm saying to you also to be encouraging that if you think you don't have any talents, then ask God for those talents. Beseech God for the talents. 
expect that God is going to give you talent so he can increase your talent and you can do a great work for God. You can be someone who starts a nonprofit that helps women who are battered, usually by their asinine husbands. They're battered and they have to flee. They need a house of refuge. So you start a nonprofit and you use God's talent to his glory. Okay? So you can do that. Be encouraged. Even if you think you don't have a lot to offer, ask God to turn you into someone who does have a lot to offer because that is the power of the Holy Spirit operating in us. It is possible for us to go from weak to being strong, indeed very strong, from not having much wisdom in the world to having the wisdom of God, which far surpasses the wisdom of the world. So be encouraged. Ask God for gifts, ask God for talents, and expect that he's going to give it, and then walk in those gifts. Walk in those talents. Be very productive. All right, so let's go on now to Matthew chapter 25, and verses 16 through 18. This is Matthew chapter 25, and verses 16 through 18. Immediately, he who received the five talents went and traded with merchants, and made another five talents. They increased a hundredfold. Verse 17. In the same way, he who got two gained another two. This person started out with less talents numerically. One had five. The other one had two. But both of them actually gained the same amount. A hundred percent. Verse 18. But he who got the one talent he did not do the same thing. He did not produce another one talent, which would have been also 100% increase. But he who got the one talent instead dug a hole in the earth and hid his Lord's money in that hole. Why did that person react in that way? And what's going to be the consequence? Because this is this person who had the one talent who went and dug a hole and put his talent in the hole, that person represents the spiritual Israelite that's going to lose their salvation where the other two, they worked. They're not only going to have their salvation, which is a gift, so they're not working for it, but they're actually going to receive many blessings of rulership in the kingdom of God. Let's read now Matthew chapter 25 and verse 19. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came. After a long time, Jesus ascended to heaven in 30 AD. It's not even 2030 yet, so it's not quite been 2,000 years, but we're approaching it. In another 10 years, it will be 2,000 years since Yeshua ascended to heaven after his resurrection. So he's been in heaven for a long time, 2,000 years, but of course he's working every day, very active. When he comes back, he wants to reconcile accounts with his servants. There is a day of reckoning that's coming for all of us who are servants of the Messiah, the future King of Kings. And we always pray, thy kingdom come. That's kind of interesting. Everybody who professes to be a Christian, at one point has probably prayed that prayer, thy kingdom come, not even realizing that that's literally what's going to happen. So it's not like we're going up to heaven to be in the clouds. No, Jesus is coming down from heaven, and we're going to rule with him on the earth. So his kingdom truly will come to this earth in its full glory. The kingdom of God is here now, in true Christians, but the kingdom of God is going to be over all of the earth, ruling over all people in the future. So Matthew chapter 25, verse 20. Matthew chapter 25, verse 20. He who received the five talents, gained another talents, and brought them to his Lord. What was the Lord's response? What is going to be Yeshua's response? In Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. His Lord said to him, Well done! Good and faithful servant, you have been faithful over a few things. I will set you over many things. 
enter into the joy of your Lord. Some people will be given 10 cities to rule over. Some people will be given 100 cities to rule over. Some people will be given 1,000 cities to rule over. And God's government, if you study God's government over Israel, you remember when Moses, who was called to be the first administrator over the nation of Israel, he encountered Jethro, and Jethro said, you take too much upon yourself, why don't you appoint judges to judge smaller things? And so you might have a lot of judges to judge the smaller things. If they can't make a decision, go up to the next level of judges or administrators. There's less of them because they have to handle less cases because it's only the harder cases. And then finally, a case comes up to you if all of the other judges can't settle. But then you don't overtax yourself. Well, that's the same system that our Father is setting up through the King of Kings when he establishes the kingdom of God here on earth. He's going to have some people who rule over one city, some over ten, and that person who rules over ten will be a little bit higher than the one who's ruling over one of his ten cities. So you get the picture. This is what is being said here. You have been faithful over a few things. The five talents that I gave you, you gained five more. You've really worked hard to double what you had. You had a large impact on people doing my work. So I will set you over many things, over many cities. I'm going to give you a lot of responsibility and enter into the joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord is to give us many, many things. And of course, this is no different from what we see in a business that's run properly. You always want to give more work to the one who's doing a lot of work because they are effective. Those, if a business is run fairly, justly, those are the people who get promoted. You're doing this, plus you're doing something extra beyond your job responsibility. You're doing something extra. I see you're intelligent, enthusiastic. People follow you. Well, let me reward you by promoting you to be supervisor over this department. What happens? They're very successful in running that department. Then a uh, opportunity comes up where somebody who was the leader of a division, they leave because they got a promotion. So this director of one department now becomes the executive director or the associate vice president over an entire division that's made up of 10 separate departments. That happens all of the time. And that's what we're talking about in this example. And then in Matthew chapter 25, Verses 22 through 23. This is now Matthew chapter 25. And verses 22 through 23. He who got the two talents came and said, Lord, you gave me two talents. Look, I have gained two more. His Lord responded, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will set you over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So again, this person overcame a lot, produced a lot, grew in God's grace and knowledge, did a lot in God's business. And that's the way to think about this. God has a business. What is the business? The business is salvation and transformation. Salvation to bring forgiveness of sins, the imputation of righteousness, and eternal life. That's salvation. But also transformation to have the law of God, the Ten Commandments, written in our hearts and in our minds so that we're transformed from people who transgress God's law consistently, habitually, and enjoying it. That's a sinner. We now repent and we go and we stay within the confines, the boundaries of God's law. So we strive to keep God's commandments because the first four commandments teach us how to love God with all of our heart, mind, and soul. And the last six teach us how to love our neighbors as ourselves. All right, so now let's go on to Matthew chapter 25 and verses 24 through 25. Matthew chapter 25 and verses 24 through 25. He who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that you are a hard man. I knew that you are a hard man. Reap 
reaping where you didn't sow and gathering where you didn't scatter. What is this person's attitude toward Christ? What is his attitude? His attitude is, you are not fair. You're very harsh. You demand things of people that are unreasonable. So therefore, I don't even want to deal with you. The stuff that you've given me, I buried it here. You can have it. I don't want to deal with you because you're too harsh. Well, is God going to have someone like that in his kingdom? No, he's not. They've been given talents, but they throw away their opportunity. These people, you can't work for salvation. That's a gift. But once you have a gift, you can throw it away. You can say, it's not valuable. I don't want to use it. So you go and bury it. That kind of person has committed the unpardonable sin. It says that when people trample upon the blood of Jesus in a very disrespectful way, after they have had the blood of Jesus cover them, their consciences are seared with a hot iron, and there remains no more sacrifice for sin. They have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. That's the unpardonable sin, because when you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, what you're saying is, this power, which is the only power God can use to transform us into loving beings, is the only power that can get our attention so that we do repent. If we reject that power, there is no more power to transform us. There is no more power to convict us. And so we go back to, of course, rejecting the Holy Spirit and just living according to the human spirit. And we know that the wages of sin is death, that we are carnal-minded, not subject to the law of God, and neither indeed can be. And so this person had that kind of perspective. You gather where you didn't uh, sow, or you reap where you didn't sow, you gather where you didn't scatter. I was afraid, and I went away and hid your talent in the earth. Here, you can have what is yours. That was his attitude, just throwing away the gift of salvation. Notice how Yeshua and our Father feel about someone like this that just says, it's not worth it. What you're offering me is not worth it. Here, take what's yours. Let's see what, how they respond to this. This is going to be in Matthew chapter 25 and verses 26 through 27. Matthew chapter 25 and verses 26 through 27. But his Lord answered him, the Lord being Yeshua, answering his servant that buried his talent. You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I didn't sow and gather where I didn't scatter. Now, Yeshua is not saying that, yes, it's true that I reap where I don't sow and I gather where I don't scatter. He's not admitting that that's the way that he is. What he's saying is, well, you knew that in your mind. That was your reality. That is your perception. And very often, a person's perception, of course, is their reality. So this is your reality. This is your perception that I reap where I don't sow and gather where I don't scatter. If that's what you had in your mind, then you should have made a decision based on that that would benefit you. And here's what he is saying you should have done, verse 27. You ought, therefore, to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have gotten back my own talent with some interest. Now, just picture this. You take the talent, instead of burying it and it not gaining anything, you take the talent and you say, all right, let me invest it. Let me put it in a bank. The bank might give me 1% back. So whatever a talent is worth, let's say that a talent is worth a dollar, and you get 1%, that means you get one penny. At least you can give your master back a dollar plus a penny. Now that's only 1% growth, it's not 10%, it's not 20%, it's not the 100% that other people did, but at least it shows a little bit of effort. At least it shows that you respect the one who gave you this gift, and you want to honor that person by 
making that gift earn some interest. He did not do that. And it's because he didn't think that the talent was worth anything. He thought it was worthless, so he just went and buried it, went off and did his thing, and then when the master came back, he said, here, take this stuff. I can't use it. It was no good in the first place. I don't trust you to do for me what you should do and what I expect you to do because you reap where you didn't sow, you gather where you don't scatter, you are unfair. Now, that should sound similar, of course, to Lucifer, who said, I will ascend above the throne of God and I will be like God. And that should sound like what he said to Eve when he said, don't you know that if you eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You don't need God. God's not fair. God is holding something back from you. You go and take what you need. Forget about God. That's the attitude of Satan. And that's what he injects as the prince of the power of the air. That's his broadcast. People all over the world are tuned in to his radio station, to his television station, and people are consuming that kind of attitude. This is the person that exhibits that. Now, on a side point, this is a side point. I told you that I teach investment classes. That is a biblical principle. There is nothing wrong with investing your money. That is not a carnal-minded thing in and of itself. Of course, if a person is greedy for filthy lucre, as one scripture says, if a person worships mammon, that's another scripture, so if a person worships money, if they covet money, if they're lustful of money, if all they think about is I want to become rich and consume everything upon myself, Yes, that's wrong, but it doesn't mean that money in and of itself is bad. It doesn't mean that being rich in and of itself is bad. And so part of our ministry is to teach people how to invest money in the stock market so that they can gain a lot of interest, hopefully doubling their money 100% like these people with the talent did, doubling their money in three to five years. That's what we try to get people to. We started a movement that's called the Million Millionaires Movement. The Million Millionaires Movement. And that's trying to get one million people moving toward becoming millionaires. Why? Because if we're faithful in little, we'll be faithful in much. If we take the little bit amount of money that we have and we faithfully invest it, then we will be in a position to help a whole lot more people. We'll be in that position to start a nonprofit, will be in that position to be able to go and do missionary work and not have to rely on people's donations. We can go take the money that we've earned and go on a mission trip and stay there for a whole month and pay for it ourselves. It's not to say it's bad to ask people for support, but sometimes people don't have the money to support you, and so sometimes people can't go on mission trips. Well, what about if you had your own money? Wouldn't you like to set up an endowment at a university, for instance, maybe donate $100,000 to a university, set up an endowment so that students can receive scholarships, grants, from the money that is generated from your $100,000 donation? So again, at the university, they'll receive $100,000, they'll say this is an endowment, meaning you cannot use that $100,000. You only use the money that's generated from that $100,000. If it gets 10% per year, that's $10,000. That means you can give a scholarship of $10,000 to a worthy student. Wouldn't you like to do something like that? People always talk about, oh, if I had a lot of money, that's what I would do. Well, how are you going to get a lot of money? You can invest your money. So that's where I take this from in part, is that even Yeshua said, be wise, use your money wisely, make your money multiply. And that's what investing in the stock market does. Okay, so here's what happens. This is really a serious judgment. Matthew chapter 25, verses 28 through 29. Matthew chapter 25, 
and verses 28 through 29. Take away therefore the talent from him and give it to him who has ten. Take away therefore the talent from him and give it to him who has ten. Take away the one talent that this person had because they're not using it. They don't value it. They did nothing with it. And give it to the one who has ten, the one who was productive. For to everyone who has will be given and he will have abundance. Matthew chapter 25, verses 29 through 30. Matthew chapter 25, and verses 29 through 30. But from him who doesn't have, even that which he has will be taken away. Now this person was given a talent, so he had something. So how can it be said, but from him who doesn't have, when he did have a talent? What it's talking about, from him who doesn't have a value attached to the gift that you have given him attached to the talent that you've given him. If that person doesn't have the sense, the common sense to know that you get a gift from God, you need to use that gift. If you don't have enough common sense to know that, then you don't have enough common sense to rule in my kingdom, so I'm going to take away even that which you have. And then it says, throw out the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And this was talking about being thrown into the lake of fire, burning until the person is no more. That's eternal death. Now, I don't want to leave us on a negative note, so let's go to the positive note. That can be depressing. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 33, Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 33, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, this is the second coming of Yeshua, then he shall sit on the throne of his glory right here on earth. All nations shall be gathered before him, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. He shall set the sheep on his right hand. So you can see that picture here. Then on the right hand of the shepherd is his sheep. But the goats, he's going to separate and be on his left-hand side. So you see the goats over here. Now we're in verses 34 through 36, Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 through 36. Then the king shall say to those on his right hand, Come, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you accompanied me. Now please keep this in mind. We're not talking about Jesus saying, you can come into my kingdom that's been prepared for you from the foundation of the world and inherit all things being co-heirs with Christ because of the works you did. That's not what he's saying because we can't work our way into salvation. What he's talking about here is because you have done these wonderful things, I'm going to make you leaders over many things. You are faithful in a few things, in the little bit that you have here on earth, whatever you have, and you multiplied it, you showed me that you know how to rule over your own finances, for instance. So you've learned that you should not be in debt, that you should be in in a position where you can be a lender because you've learned how to rule over your finances. And I have a series of programs that will be coming up soon called Dominating Your Dominion. We've been created in God's image and likeness. God has dominion over all things because we were created in God's image and likeness. He's given us dominion over all things on the earth, so we need to dominate our dominion. One dominion that we have control over is our finances. Since we can dominate our dominion, when we get to the kingdom, that's a part of our dominion. We can teach others how to use finances properly. So that's what it's talking about. You are responsible in this life, so I'm going to make you and give you more responsibility in the life to come. That's what it's talking about. Not working for salvation, but we can have a greater reward based on the works that we do. We can have more responsibilities to help bring about utopia to other people because we've learned how to do it. 
we've put our heart into it, and we've increased a hundredfold. And then in verses 41 through 43, Matthew chapter 25, verses 41 through 43, then he shall say to those on his left hand, you cursed, depart from me into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Notice this is talking about eternal death. Depart from me into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, but you gave me no food. I was thirsty, but you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, but you did not take me in. I was naked, but you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, but you didn't bother to visit me. You didn't take what I gave you, whatever talent it was, you didn't take it and multiply it. You didn't value it, you just threw it away. You buried it. So since you have not learned how to rule over what I've given you on this earth, I'm not going to entrust you to rule over people in the world tomorrow. And that's what he's talking about, okay? All right, so to wrap this up, we're almost finished here. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 40. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 40. And then skipping down to verse 46. Starting out in Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. Then the king shall explain to them, saying, Inasmuch as you serve one of the least of these, my brothers, you have served me. And there's a scripture that says, How can you say that you love God, whom you have not seen, when you don't love your neighbor whom you have seen. In other words, we can make up God in our own image. Instead of us being made in God's image, we can make God in our image. We can imagine God as a certain being, and then we can say we love him. But God is saying, wait, wait, wait. I'm telling you that if you love me, you have to love those whom I have created. And if we don't love those whom our Father has created, and everybody's our brother and sister. We all come from the same original ancestors, Adam and Eve. And even then we come from God the Father and Jesus the Christ. They created all of us, all from one blood. We all have the human spirit. And all of us eventually who accept Yeshua as the Messiah will have the Holy Spirit. So we're all a part of the family of mankind right now. We, some of us are part of the family of God right now. But eventually all people who will be alive, will be resurrected from the dead, given eternal life, will be spirit-composed, full-fledged children of God in the family of God in the most glorious fashion. So the king shall explain to them, saying, Inasmuch as you serve one of the least of these, my brothers, you have served me. You unrighteous ones, and now verse 46, you unrighteous ones shall receive everlasting death. But you righteous ones shall receive everlasting life. And that is very, very encouraging. I so said I want to leave us on an encouraging note. And we are called to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Messiah. We are called to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Messiah. We should be taking the talents that we've been given, whether it's one, two, or five, and growing, making it grow. What we have discovered in this series is this. A, the physical nation of Israel expected a military Messiah to free them from Roman occupation and make them the lead nation. Therefore, they missed the need for there to first be a suffering Messiah followed by the glories of a military Messiah. They missed that. And then point C, unfortunately, false Christianity, by which I mean primarily Catholicism and Protestantism, they have also missed the full revelation of the parables, for they don't understand that there will indeed be a military Messiah that sets the spiritual nation of Israel, which is the church, sets the spiritual nation of Israel free from the revived Roman Empire, which of course will be led by the Roman Catholic Church and her harlot daughters, the Protestant churches, as they ride over the beast power, the revived Roman military political government system. So there's going to be church and state joined together and they will be led by Satan the devil and then by the feet, 
by the beast and the false prophet. So they don't understand that spiritual nation of Israel will be set free from the revived Roman Empire and the military Messiah will make us the lead nation on earth. And this will happen at Christ's second coming. So I hope you've enjoyed this series of programs on 15 parables unveiled and understood. I hope that you will subscribe to our YouTube channel, click on the notification button so you can be aware of new programs, hit the like button that helps other people to be able to find our program and when you tell people about Christian Ambassadors in the search bar, make sure you tell them to put Christian Ambassadors plural in the double quotes and then they'll be able to find our YouTube channel very easily. Again, thank you very much for your attention during this series of programs.